Hi, everybody. It's the A to Z podcast. Zach Jackson, Andre Knott, at Akron Jackson, at Dre Knott on most of your favorite social media platforms, A to Z podcast.com, Facebook.com slash A to Z podcast. Shouts, as always, to Scene, to the Honeymoon Grill, to American Fireworks. They're open for the holidays. They'll do gift certificates for the holidays. They're always open at AmericanFireworks.com. Honeymoon Grill has a drive through window that I use not every day, but pretty damn close. The food is always excellent, and they make it easy in these strange times. Um, first, if you're new here, welcome. Glad to have you. Uh, we, we get excited. We venture into mature slash immature subjects, and we often say four-letter words. So if that's not for you or if you're in a work environment, uh, put on your earbuds or come back and listen to A to Z at another time. Oh, what a time, Dre. Um, the Browns were back on Monday Night Football. They played an all-time game with an all-time bad beat at the end. Uh, I wrote them off about three times during the game. They showed guts. It's not a victory, right? And ultimately, they have to get by right. Baltimore and Pittsburgh. But right. you look at this team, and, and here's what's most encouraging. You don't even have to look at the history of the team, which we know is awful, right? And, and if you're pessimistic, it can cloud what you do. And if you're optimistic, it can give you that uneasy feeling. Just look at how they've played since the bye week at the middle of the season, the various circumstances under which they've operated, how they've handled their business. They're playing their best right now. They've earned the right to play big games, to play their own way into the playoffs. And it's not done yet because they didn't win. And they're certainly far from perfect because you could start at safety for them right now. But overall, you have to be really encouraged. And you have to say, okay, like you get some of these check marks out of the way, including playing in the big games and adjusting and showing you're not dead when you're down 14, right? And then all of a sudden, right. for the first time in 15 freaking years, you can have some real expectations going forward. Yeah, I mean, we've talked for so many years during Browns games and Brown seasons about moral victories, and it's one of those, as a journalist or whatever the hell they want to call me in 2020, some call me the N-word, some call me a friend, some call me an asshole. I'll answer the most if you're the right color. Um, <laughs> in a lot of ways, we have trying to figure out what exactly a moral victory is, right? And in 2007, when you lose to Cincinnati, and I'm just I, – I, I, I have to pick random games and the conversations we had. And in 2007, when we got on that bus in Cincinnati and got on the plane to come back at eight and a half Popeyes, I wanted to cut somebody out because I barely had slept the night before, but that always happened when we went to Cincinnati. Um, we talked about moral victories then, and it was like, well, they're going to win 10 games. They've never been in this situation before. The next time Chud has a chance to call plays in this type of weather, this will happen, and they're going to learn from it and, and overcome it and become better. Like, we've had those conversations, Zach, right? Like, and I just use that game because that's an easy game to go off of because it was like, it was a successful season. Um, you can go off of, and I hope he's listening with his mumbling ass, you can go off of 2007 when they lose to Arizona on the last play of the game in a crazy game where it went back and forth, and Sean Smith gets on there and decides the Pepsi man needs to get his ass beat. And we all agreed, Phil Dawson had to break it up. Those aren't moral victories because that team wasn't mature enough or able to grow enough and understand the situation at hand. What happened Monday night to me was the biggest step since the Browns came back in 99. And you just kind of said it. They fought their asses off. It's a reality now that we can talk about the Baltimore versus the Browns as a real rivalry. Now, they still got to conquer that, that with the Pittsburgh Steelers, in my mind. But when the Ravens walked off the field Monday night, they felt like, and I'm, I'm putting words in their mouth because I watched, and I've watched them play. That's how they walk off the field after they play the Steelers. That's how they walk off the field when they play the Patriots, when they play teams that have pushed them to the, to the furthest point that they can go to. Um, and I know moral victories aren't something that you do victory laps over. I know victory laps are real cool for the kids in, in, in the 20s. Um, I'm not victory lapping for the Browns. I'm victory lapping for the city that – you, you do have something to be proud of. You do have something to look forward to. Um, I like how they came back, Zach. And I can't, I can't get into it with people that are like, oh, they scored too quick. Look, they're in the infancy stage of figuring out how to win. Yes. Um, I'm not going to get on them that they scored when they scored, how they scored. And, and look, if Baltimore doesn't have the best damn kicker in the NFL over the last two decades, they still may be playing right now. 
Yeah, um, you know, I go back to two hours before that game and watching the guys warm up. And listen, I mean, now you're alarmed about your kicker situation, but Cody Parkey for two months has been pretty money, right? Uh, I'm not he, alarmed. He picked the wrong I know time. You're dreaming, but I'm not. Yeah. Right. Well, he picked the wrong time to have a bad night, and that'll happen. But, you know, in these bad weather games, you've seen him show that he's been a bad weather kicker and, and kick these knuckleballs and these low ones that, in, you know, it's not Phil Dawson, right? But it's it's right. it shows that he knows, that he's worked at his craft and understands the stadium, the elements, all of those things, right? So two hours before the game, he's at that end, and he's on one hash and Justin Tucker's on the other. And he's kicking from 49 and I think up to 52. And he's making one. He missed one bad, but he's doing that. And then Justin Tucker's next to him just hitting these freaking rainbows right through. And you're just saying this is the greatest (laughs) kicker ever. And I think that's why Kevin Stefanski did not call the timeout to ice. I think he tried a little reverse psychology because he's over there saying to himself, we're not going to fucking ice Justin Tucker. Right. Right. Like, right. <laughs> like we're just not. Too. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up because I thought about that as well. And I was like, you don't, you don't gain anything out of this one. Hey, guys, leave him alone. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, um, it, it's never one play, right, Dre? It's never one situation. Right. Multiple times they had to get stops. They couldn't. They, they dug themselves that hole because they, they could not get stops. The defense ran out of talent. Right, they don't have Denzel Ward, yes. so they have to have non NFL players playing significant snaps. It's just how it is. And then at the end, you know Mark Andrews is his security blanket, and you allow him two easy receptions. You know, so to me, what gets lost, and this isn't lost in Baltimore because it's the Willis Reed moment. He comes in, yeah. he's yeah. going to easily run for the first down, but no one covers Marquise Brown, and he has to throw it. Like I didn't see. He was so open, Dre, that I didn't yeah. see him. When when Lamar cocked his arm back, I thought, what in the world are you doing? You can run for the first down plus six more yards before you even make a cut. And then when right. I looked and I saw the ball floating in the night. So, yeah, you had multiple chances to get a stop. Uh, I mean, I, I'll just yeah. say this. You know, the quarterback has shown everybody clear growth, right? And to be – No doubt. The Ravens' defense, personnel-wise, is not what it was a couple of years ago. But it is still a scheme. Not even earlier this season. Yeah, it is still a pressure scheme that has given him fits. It is still a veteran group that was in a must-win situation. And with the Browns' backs all the way against the wall, they slugged right back into that game. So, yes, so moral victories. I'm glad you brought up 2007. And it's long ago, and it's five NFL generations ago. But, guys, this is the first winning Browns team since then, which I'm sure you already knew if you're listening. But that can't be reinforced enough. And I promise you, I don't remember in detail all of those things. I worked for the team. Dre was a sideline reporter. We knew all those guys. We were together every day of our lives for six months. I promise you, when coming out of that season, there was disappointment they didn't make it, but there were good vibes. And then they obviously weren't sustained for – so. I promise you that good vibes for the Browns matter right now, and we'll see. And and, and we we trust in Andrew Barry, but he's got a lot to prove still. We're, we're starting to see more from the quarterback, but he's still got plenty to prove. And you know, some of you guys who watch a game and immediately come at me, I, you must be Lake Travis <laughs> alums, or you must run the Baker Mayfield T shirt dot com. I don't know what it is, but like the one guy that get, the one guy the one guy came at you with the best. You are hands down the best beat reporter on the beat, but you're absolutely wrong about Baker Mayfield. <laughs> Do you know how bad that made me laugh and made me want to call that guy? I didn't, I didn't even see that one, to tell you the truth. <laughs> oh, man. I was crying laughing. Go ahead, though. What anyway. Saying. Yeah, so anyway, they've created good vibes. If you ha- the, the head coach shows me that he knows what he's doing. Offensive lines make this stuff sustainable. The Browns are in a good spot. Let's not run from the fact that the Browns have not won shit yet, and another loss to the Ravens reinforces that you have not crossed even the first roadblock, right? And defensively, man, you got a lot to fix. (laughs) A lot to fix. But this season has been a success. You're looking forward to the games. You're looking forward to the future. And, like, you have uniquely gifted players who are taking their game to another level. Kareem Hunt, I'm speaking of. You have Rashard oh, yeah. Higgins' of the world stepping way up. Donovan Peoples-Jones 
who is yeah. still a baby deer out there, but he's proving he belongs. He's proving that he could be the jackpot pick of becoming a full-time starter in this league once he figures things out, right? So, like – it's all positive, and this week is a new challenge, and there are more questions to answer. I said last week, Dre, they thought they pranced around the social media streets like they'd won the world championship, and I thought it was great they were playing the Ravens because I'd be waiting for a letdown. Well, now you're on your third yep. road game in four weeks, right? You just, you've had two four-hour games in a row, physically and mentally exhausting games. Yeah. You have a game you exactly. can't win because the Giants' offense stinks. Colt McCoy might be playing. In 2020, Colt McCoy might yeah. be playing. But well, let's not let's not get ahead of all of that. But I know what you're getting to. Yeah. You're getting to that emotionally. You better get it right. You play. You play eight great quarters of football, and suddenly, if you start reading, and and, and I only bring up 07 because 07 was one of those years. It was the infancy then as well, and no one knew how to react, and the reaction wasn't very good um, because you had people all wanting money, and because you wanted. Uh, you, you had people that hadn't experienced it and didn't know how to act. And, and you saw every guy get contract extensions and tell him bits that he didn't get one. And you never got off to the next season on the right foot. And Absolutely. And quarterback. All this real and stuff that the Browns have not dealt with in years. Years. Yes. Yes. And that all comes back now. So I'm glad you're saying what you're saying because, you know, winning that game and having the 10th win of the season would have been huge. Um, and, and let me go back with something else you brought up that I got to say. Yes, the Baltimore Ravens are not the Baltimore Ravens that, that had a guy that had a white suit on that he couldn't find no more, uh, that had one of the best defenses ever. But when you score 42 points on the Baltimore Ravens, Zachary Jackson, you've done a hell of a job. I don't got any books in front of me or any magazines to give me records, but I know from, from, from being around this, the Baltimore Ravens don't give up 40 points to anybody, no matter who's on the field. Um, and that, you know, Mike Tomlin, I said this on a radio show, couple nights last night um i think mike tomlin has one of the best slogans that you can have in life or for a football team and and i want to adopt it and take it because in everything in life and i think we can say it for our podcast i love how he says the standard is the standard meaning no matter who plays no matter how hot it is how cold it is who got injured um you know whatever happens the standard is the standard when his team walks in the field, right? The Browns have changed their standard this year, I think. And I'm not saying they're the Steelers. I'm not saying that they're, they're even the Ravens. But the standard has changed because for a quarterback that we both looked at as an average quarterback three, four, five weeks ago, and I feel like that was a fair assessment in how he had played up until that time. And he still has some things to work on, but I'll give him this. When the lights shine the brightest, when everything was on the line, when look, how many times have the Browns been down 14 in the beginning of a fourth quarter and the stadium looks exactly how it looked this past Monday because the patrons knew it was time to go back out and finish those cheap Bud Lights uh, in the car because there's no way in hell your team was coming back. And instead, you know, like, like there's just a lot of steps I can see. And, like, is the defense bad? Yeah. But we knew the defense was going to be this bad back in, in August. Now is the hard part of, um, I had a friend whose brother played in the NFL. I'll leave his name out of it. But a, somebody that played a pretty high-level football. Uh, and he said, Dre, they got nobody in the back seven. And I go, well, their their best corners are watching like we are, number one. Um, but I guess, and I don't want to, and this isn't the time or place for this conversation, but it will be interesting to see how Andrew Barry tries to supplement, because there's a lot of money still on the table. You still got to pay all the guys you got this past year. Their contracts go way up, by the way. I'm sure you know. You still got to take care of the quarterback in some shape, way, or form. I'm not giving him Cedar Point and, and half of Northeast Ohio. Like right, y'all right. Want. No, uh, look, but, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's part of it. But you got to pay him. Um, you got to pay You got to pay Chubb. There's, it's going to be interesting how they, how they take care of the money. But also, you know, how much do you believe in these young linebackers? You know, we can have all the talks we want about Saki Taki and Goodson – um, but the reason why the Steelers are the Steelers and the Ravens are the Ravens, they draft a badass linebacker every single year, whether they need one or not. You know, Vince Williams has been around for what almost a decade, right? But At least they still draft Devin. They still draft Devin Bush. They yeah. still draft the kid from what Central Michigan that busts heads open constantly. The Browns are going to have to find that cycle because the reason why the average conversation was the conversation that it was 
and I'll stop after this and let you go. But the average conversation about Baker was had because I think what Zach and I, and I don't want to put words in Zach's mouth, but I'll put them in my, my own. I know that if you want to be as good or as great as everybody feels right now, what you saw Monday night is the standard. And to win in that standard, you need above average at quarterback. And I'm not saying six can't be. Six can be. He showed that Monday night. But that kid on the other side, whether he was pooping, whether he was getting IVs, whatever he was doing back there, that's a grade A talent. And his standard is different. And his standard ain't going away for a while. And then if you don't have to deal with that standard, you got to deal with the standard over in Kansas City of putting steak on his, on his or putting ketchup on his steak. To beat those type teams, you need above average. That's the standard now. Yes. Since the pot, since the day this podcast started, we've been telling you guys that in the hot take world and in the pro sports world, the truth is often in the middle, right? Yep. And everybody that watched the fourth quarter of that game and wants to give him nine years and four hundred fifty billion. <laughs> <laughs> no, that being said, <laughs> that that being said. He has, after three awful weather games, he has his play, and specifically the coach, tailoring the offense to his strengths, have opened doors in this offense that were not open previously, right? The season yeah. is not over. The, pro- the process is not over. He is way better than almost all of your realistic options for next year. Given no the f- Activating the fifth-year option – Seem, seems the right play. But that locks you in for two more years. So, But that, that seems mm-hmm. the right play because that decision has to be made. Paying Denzel Ward, assuming he gets back and plays at anywhere near the level that he's played, and he was supposed to practice this afternoon. We're recording this as practice is going on. Um, you know, that's got to happen. And I've maintained that paying Nick Chubb's got to happen, right? Yeah. But to get to that standard and to keep raising that standard – the defense has to be a whole lot better, and you got a lot of decisions to make, starting with Olivier Vernon, Larry Ogunjobi, Sheldon Richardson. You can't count agree. on Greedy Williams. I mean, you, uh, you, you just can't. Um, you know, all four of your starters in Denzel's absence are free agents, and the secondary starters are free agents. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, I hope Sheldrick Redwine balls out. He's a, he's a nice kid, and he was always a little bit of a developmental guy. But guys, they've been playing Andrew Sandejo all year. They're telling you Sheldrick Redwine's not very fucking good. They're playing Andrew oh. Sandejo, let me tell you that. I mean, he is the worst player in the NFL, and he has started every hey, game man. and has played 95% of the snaps. Be nice. J.K. Dobbins blessed him. J.K. Dobbins folded that man. Blessed he him. He folded a grown-ass <laughs> man. Ooh. I tip my head to Sandejo. He knows, he knows better than we know. And you know I've always had to talk with you. Bad <laughs> I don't only want to talk bad about it. Bad players know they bad before you know they yes. bad. Yes. Yes. Right? <laughs> he knows. That yes. dude puts his heart out there. But here's the thing if you're red wine. Because, see, this is the conundrum of sports when you get to this level. Even when you get to high school. For me, it was in college when I saw a bunch of Canadians that were a little bit taller than me, not faster than me, but I knew they were going to get better opportunities because they had natural size that I did. You know what I mean? Like, And then there were guys that were – Bigger than me, faster than me, stronger than me. And we were, and I was on the worst college football team in America. Mm-hmm. And even at 18, I was smart enough to know my conundrum was done. I could outsmart them all I want. These dumb assholes were faster and stronger than me. I wasn't going to win. I was just going to be a practice dummy. I got that. And I understood that. And I understood what being a college student was, and I enjoyed it. For Zendejo, you can't blame him for accepting these checks because these dumb asses behind you can't realize <laughs> the easy part of the game. Right. And now the Browns have to go to Red Wine and, and, and all these other guys. It's a golden opportunity, Zach. It's it a sure golden is. opportunity for these young kids to get an opportunity out there. And at this point, you can make it, especially against the next two weeks, you can make a couple of mistakes and it probably won't kill you. Um, because the mistake made the Marquise Brown touchdown, and, and I, I don't want to intertwine this without – I want to say this the right way defensively, there are going to be some jobs open. And I hope and pray, knock on wood, that because of the success they've had, because of the adults in the room 
Remember, that's how we started talking about this team back in September. Remember the first thing I said to you, I was like, damn, man, they got actual adults running the team. This is pretty cool. Because of that, I hope that you can get free agents and you get guys that want to be here. Veterans, not veterans that are, you know, that, that are Willie McGinnis in you, putting on their ski cap, taking the last few million before they go to the NFL <laughs> Network. Like, you know, guys that actually can still play, that ain't just taking some money so they can put something down on the college fund for their, for their you know, the next, the next. And I don't want to put anybody else down. Or I don't want to talk about the veterans that Mangini brought in. But you know what I mean. Like, legitimate veterans that have played within the division, legit, you know, legitimate veterans that have played in the conference that will say, you know what? My last two, three years, I want to come to Cleveland and, and, and be a two-down player and help them get to the next stop. That's what games like Monday night hopefully provide, that you can go out and get those guys, you can draft a couple guys, because you can't go into April swinging for the fence in free agency and think, voila, the defense is going to be fixed. That's not going to happen. But the other thing I'll say is this, offensively and just overall, Marquise Brown played a terrible game on Monday night. Can't, he's been dropping the ball all season long. Runs his mouth constantly, never consistent. Right. But the threat of him being able to go down the middle of the field, let, like Joe Woods, and I know there was a guy on my Twitter feed, God bless him, I actually love him because we actually have good banner back and forth. But he's like, Joe Woods has got to go. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Joe Woods played the perfect defense, in my opinion, and Zach may even disagree. He played the perfect defense for three quarters against, um, against Jackson. Yes, Jackson ran for 100 and some odd yards. Part of that is just he's unbelievable. Part of it is you've got you to gotta tackle his ass when you get him. But he, he, he took away the middle of the field from him, Zach. He, and, and for as good as Jackson is, he can't throw outside the numbers, outside the hashes for an irregularity. He can do it here and there. And Joe Woods played the perfect defense. But because he started running all over him, then you get to fourth and five. And what's Marquise Brown finally do? Slips past the secondary. Because why the safeties, and I can't blame them, your eyes are on, are on, are on eight. How are they yeah. not on that guy? Right. How are they not? Which all I want to, to button that up, all I want to say is this. Don't be foolish anymore calling radio stations, tweeting at people like me and, and, and others, telling us that the Browns are better or Baker's better without having Odell Beckham out there. <laughs> if you couldn't see early in the game, the effect of not having a receiver. And, and Zach gave props to all the other guys. I'm not belittling Hollywood who played very Berea-like with all the fumbles early. I'm not putting down the kid out of Michigan because the kid out of Michigan, Peoples Jones, I will credit him. He has been – I will credit him because things I saw the first couple of weeks, he's gotten better at. And he's given them a legitimate threat downfield. He is having problems. I mean, look, a lot of receivers have problems getting off their – those two corners that they got, they're, they're top of the line. And they'll, and they'll tell you about it during the game and after the game and on the play. Um, you need 13 in games like like Monday night. And I have some people go, well, they scored 42. Well, you may have scored 60 if you would have had Beckham because if you saw early, the Ravens didn't respect the receiving core for the Browns, came up, jammed, put a bunch of people in the box, exotic blitzes, but because the fancy is good enough to call him plays and, and, and screen the shit out of him, he ran every screen I've ever seen on that first drive. I've never oh. seen a receiver screen to a tight end, tight end screen, I mean, the guy went in his bag early, but he did it because he realized that was a pivotal part of the game, Zach. Well, what a they great, had to get him out of that yeah. defense. What a great cat and mouse game that was because the Ravens are the number one pressure team in the league every year, right? And, and, right. and if right. when they're not number one, they're number four. That's, that's who they are. And he almost screened them so much that it was like, okay, they possibly can't expect another one, right? Right, um, right, right. Um, and b- before I get back to... One other thing, the um, the the fir- you know, Peoples Jones has the thirty yarder on the last drive, and it's a huge play, and it's it sets up everything, right? But the first one from Mayfield to Peoples Jones, it's like a twenty one yarder, but it's like a forty five yard throw. I mean, that was as big time a throw and catch as you'll see, right? Yeah. Uh, you know which one I'm talking about to the Browns sideline yeah. um, over some line. people, yeah, yeah. just first quarter, I think. No, second, early second quarter, because the Browns went the other way in the first quarter, if I'm remembering correctly. But that was big, big time. But the thought you bring in there, Dre, th- this is why it's stupid for us to even say I can't believe that people want to argue some of these things. So last week I wrote about Rashard Higgins, um, you know, getting cut from an 0-16 team, being dismissed by multiple staffs, you know, never being 
you know, being replaced by Odell Beckham, being replaced by all these by Kadero Hodge this year of all people, right? And how he keeps coming back. And Rashard gave really thoughtful answers on all that he's been through and how he's had to wait his turn. And like the numbers were staggering. He would catch a game winning touchdown, right? And then he would play twenty eight snaps the next three games total. You know, it's just it's it's a crazy career arc full of all these spikes. Well, I write the story over the weekend. We put it up Sunday night or Monday morning. And Monday at noon, I go to look at the comments on it. And, like, the first ten are, like, great story. Um, we've always liked Richard. We appreciate him. And then all of a sudden it turned into, this is why the Browns don't miss Odell Beckham. And I am just, like, oh. cringing. Like, no, no. Both can be true. Richard Higgins is a super yeah. sub. He's a precise route runner. And the, co- and the quarterback trusts him. 100x more than he ever trusted Odell Beckham but the Browns miss Odell Beckham and you saw that for three quarters Dre because Marlon Humphrey who's been known to swallow up Odell Beckham did a damn good job mm-hmm. on Jarvis Landry and without a couple yes, of penalties and without Marcus Peters having to leave I mean these are circuit this is the game within the game one of the Baker had some big time throws I've already picked out two of them right but one of the smartest things he did was start going to Higgins, who all of a sudden had the fourth corner on him because Marcus Peters was out of the yep. game. Like the game yeah. within the game, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And this week it'll be and interesting because the, the Giants have a absolute top-tier corner in Bradbury, and he would assume you'll be on Jarvis Landry. You would assume that this defense with Jabril Peppers right in the middle of it, actually playing within 35 yards of the line of scrimmage, they'll be focused, <laughs> they'll be blitzing. They'll be focused on the run game, and the Browns are going to have to loosen them up, and it's going to have to be Rashard Higgins and Donovan Peoples-Jones making those plays to open up everything. I think it'll be a totally different game. I'll be shocked if it's in the 40s or even the 30s. But to oh, beat yeah. this Giants defense that is going to that is built to stuff the run, when a lot aren't, uh, and I want to talk about this too, one of the things that makes the Browns okay. unique is nobody even runs the ball, right? You watch Pittsburgh and Buffalo, and they don't even try to run the ball, either right. team. Right, right. Um, right. It's amazing. Look, uh, I'll, I'll button that up by saying you got to be unique, right? More than that, though, you got to be good at something. The Browns are really yeah. good at running the ball. Credit to the offensive line, the coach, and obviously the two dynamic backs. And when they can get in a situation to where Chubb is going to do most of the running and Hunt's going to catch some passes and be fresh in the fourth quarter. And credit to Stefanski, they were down eight or whatever it was, and he still ran the ball with Kareem. He, and yeah. without those gashing yeah. runs that really got guys on their heels, again, that opened things up. So just just I'm just encouraged by the state of the offense and encouraged in a growing year that, that this offense specifically, but the team as a whole, has handled these circumstances. Guys, except for Olivier's few moments and Miles' game-changing plays, the defense hasn't given him shit. The special teams oh. continues to be a negative every single week, oh. right? Right. And here you right. are right. at nine and four, feeling good about your quarterback and having the best one and two running back combo in a long, long time, maybe that the league it's has amazing. ever seen. It's amazing. You know the other thing about matchups and needing Odell. You made a great point. The injuries to Marcus Peters and others, they get down to their fourth or fifth. But before that happens, Stefanski did something that I thought was great, and you just hit on it. I just want—I got to bring this up. He knew the—he knew the situation. He knew, and look, he usually does a great job, and he did it the other night. He moves Jarvis around, and Jarvis only gets to 50, 60 yards because Jarvis is a chain mover. He's not the typical number one. What A to Z told you years ago already—not a surprise. But what he did was he used his maybe without without Odell healthy, maybe his second best receiver. He uses. His running back, Hunt. Yeah. Hunt had one of the biggest catches in the game. And it was a great throw, great play. But that just tells you how much, look, it's great that you have that type of talent. But if you don't have Hunt, and you don't get back in the game because you couldn't throw the ball because those corners, before they got hurt, were locking down those guys we were talking about. Talented teams win because they have talented players. Um, and it's funny because we talk about this. Obviously, this week would all be about Odell going back to New York. And we would talk about this trade, and we'd talk about who won and who lost it. And I don't know enough about New York. I know Peppers is playing better. Um, Zeitler, Zeitler is what I would say. But I guess you can't say that. It was a loss last year. Not a loss this season because of Wyatt Seller. you got the two best guards, according to you know, pro football focus. you got the two best guards in football right now. Um, 
Is it fair to say, and it's, I'm saying it's because of injury, that the, that the injury, that the trade rather kind of a wash at this point in time? Am I, is, it, is that okay for me to say that or not? Yeah, I mean, I think the Giants feel good about it. They certainly haven't won anything, right? Um, I think right. the Browns missed Jabril Peppers, <laughs> no, no doubt about it. But, you know, the, the, the trade was made. Kevin Zeitler was making $14 million as a guard. That's just not, especially when you already have another guard making that, like it right. was time to choose, right? Um, the Browns right. needed to upgrade their pass rush. Olivier mm-hmm. Vernon is a guy that was – left out by the Giants because they kept pulling the Browns and kept changing schemes and he was not in his natural spot, right? And then the right. opportunity to get Beckham comes with with what the quarterback showed you as a rookie and with what you thought. I mean, yeah. I, it doesn't matter who won the trade, and I know that's not <laughs> a popular take, right? The trade was made. The Browns have changed again since. We don't know what Vernon's future or Beckham's future is with this team, but you know what? We don't really know what anybody's is. The Browns got to try to win now. No. The Browns got to keep building what they're building, and we'll see what happens. When we talk before about the, most, the defensive well, line needing the contracts and the young guys, right. the class of 18 needing the contracts, I mean, eventually receivers where you would think you're going to save some money, right? Like, For sure, right? You would think. Right. Um, well, you just made the most sense of the trade, though. And, and you just said it in calmly, the money. The Browns had to get rid of Zeitler. The Giants felt like they had to get rid of Odell. They didn't want to pay Olivier. Like, like think about it. Really, everything that happened in that trade was the money, and, and then they was like, okay, we'll throw Peppers in there because you're giving us a talent wide receiver. But really, it was the money deal more than anything else. You just, For me, when you just broke it down the way you did, there's no way in the world the Browns could keep playing Zeitler, what they were paying, and considering what was on the roster. The Giants obviously were, were, were and may – well, they're not anymore – but they were a dumpster fire, and they, they didn't want to pay a receiver that didn't want to be there and was a pain in the ass if you're not going to win. Uh, and you knew Eli was going away, and you wanted to start with a new quarterback. To me, it's a, you said it, it was a wash of money. It was like an NBA trade, basically. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, the, the Odell wars are going to go on. The Baker wars are going to go on, right? It's just – it's what's been chosen. Um, I got about six minutes, guys. I, I have a, a Zoom I have to be on at a certain time. Um did you see just, James Harden last night? I want to – well, we'll get, save that thought for the end, but two quick things. <laughs> I really liked Kevin Zeitler as a person, super nice guy, um, really good player. You know, unfortunately, he's he spent most of his career on, on bad teams. You know, he, he, he was on one of those Bengals playoff teams maybe too. But, um, That's right. you know, his situation is, is what it was. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the summer of 18 – yeah – I flew out to Milwaukee to go see Joe Schobert and where Joe is from, Kevin Zeitler is from actually has a house out there. Whole deal. Anyway, a uh, friend of mine from Cleveland was living in Milwaukee at the time, took me to this little restaurant slash bar, world famous chicken wings. And my gosh, they were good. I remember the place as it is. And I've recommended <laughs> the place to people who have ended up in Milwaukee since then. Anyway, that's the middle of the summer. Fast forward about four months, and I get a text from the same guy who says, I went back to Points East tonight. I said, well, that was a good decision. And he has a picture. Kevin Zeitler's dad was in the bar handing out business cards that said, vote for Kevin Zeitler for the Pro Bowl. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you little league douchebag dads who play zone <laughs> in youth basketball, you have company. <laughs> Right. And I don't mean to call Mr. Zeitler a douchebag. I'm just I'm just saying. But the other thing I wanted to make sure I threw out there and we can certainly talk about James Harden, because I think Jerry Steakhouse is the greatest nickname I've ever seen in my life. Um, This morning I was writing and I was doing some research, uh, the conference title games this weekend. You know, nobody's slowed down Alabama all year long. Dre. Uh, Florida apparently has one of the best cornerbacks in the country. He's a sophomore. Uh From Riviera Beach, Florida, he wears number five. His name is Kair Elam. Yes, his father is yep. Abe Elam. Yes. Ain't that a crazy? I thought he was another brother because they had about 15 brothers, and I had to look it up and realize. And, and what has what Gainesville got on them damn Elams? After he went to Notre Dame and ran into some problems, all Elams go to Florida now. Yeah. It's ama- isn't that amazing how old we really are? Didn't you tweet uh, we me really somebody are. else? We you really are, but Abe's not as old as us. Uh, what's that? <laughs> Abe is not as old as us. I, I know. That's that saying. There's somebody else you tweeted me about that's like the number one recruit. Their son is a – and I was just like, geez. I mean, well, here. I'll put it this way. I tweeted this out yesterday. The Chronic by Dr. Dre. 
came out 28 years ago. I remember being a freshman at St. Vincent St. Mary riding the bus as a freshman to play JV basketball to, um, we were going to Youngstown to play, take on the Fighting Irish up in Youngstown. You know who that is, Zach. And I got from from my cousin, I got the CD. And in my disc, man, Andy Norman was my coach. Stowe's Stowe's finest was my coach. He was, I was sitting in the back of the bus and he was like, Andre, what are you listening to? And I'll never forget showing him the Dr. Dre cover and it had the chronic and it was the chronic. And he looked at me and he goes, what does your ass know about having that type of album? Give it here. (laughs) That was 28 years ago. And, I, and, Dr., and I'll tell y'all something. I'm going to tell you a little bit pop or something. The Chronic's still the best album of all time. I'm going to listen to it as soon as we done with this podcast. <laughs> I remember the first time I heard The Chronic, too. I, I will say I heard some words that I previously had not heard before. <laughs> <laughs> and I can picture what that album looks like. Absolutely. absolutely. freaking lutely All right. Um, so the hey, pictures of James picture Harden pop up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes me think about Popeye days when I was hitting Popeyes up every Tuesday. Um, I mean, he's a, this is a, this is they built everything around him. I can't stand what's happening. I hate that situation. I hate what he's doing. I know the NBA is a players' league, is what we like to call it. I just think it's embarrassing. Um, and I know other guys have done it, Zach. But think about all that they've done for James Harden. They've built the entire team around him. They've traded guys in and out for him. They ran an offense particularly just for him. Um, this is this is this is lack of professionalism at, at, at its highest. No doubt, no doubt. Um, now these guys are such freaks that he'll probably be in three weeks, be in game shape. But that is absolutely ridiculous, and the jokes were warranted, right? <laughs> um, yeah, hell of a situation there. Um, it's I, I wouldn't, you know, whoever's in charge down there now. God bless them, because I, I don't know what the answer is uh, to dealing with that when he he clearly wants out. He clearly is not going to give you his best, right? And you got to right. deal with but that. But you made a good point. Yeah. You made a good point. Him getting back in shape will be nothing. It, it's way different from him getting, losing 15 pounds than you or I trying to lose 15 pounds. He'll be back in shape. He's out of shape like that to prove another point. That's just, you know, it's – that it's just like the boyfriend that wants his girlfriend. You know, ever, you ever be around? Yeah, I know you are, and I won't say any names. You ever have any of those friends that they're too scared to break up with their girlfriend, so they'll make their girlfriend break up with them? That's what James Harden. Is. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be uh, going to be interesting. All right, guys, uh, thanks for listening. Like I said, I got to get out Last of here. Thing. I, I, one thing I got to say this quickly. I got to say this. Um, congratulations to the A to Z podcast to Andre and Zach. Fuck everybody else. I'm saying this, and not to fuck everybody else. That's just me being a dumbass. I say that because I was blown away, Zach, Monday, when I went back and found that podcast from five years ago. I couldn't listen to the whole podcast because I don't like listening to myself. Um, and I know we talk all over each other, but there were some funny parts. Um, I'm just amazed that this podcast has been going as long as it has been going. Shout out to little Mikey for going and finding uh, that pod because that pod was from so long ago uh, that it took some searching and it took some work to find it. Um, but I and, I and I don't do stuff like this. I got awards and I got all kinds of other stuff, but I'm proud to, um, I'm proud to say this is the, the podcast that I started with and we've been going this long and we're still finding a way to put out some decent quality podcasts, man. So my hat's off to you. Um, and hopefully we keep doing it. For, I know, and, and I know that wasn't the beginning. We had more before then. It was just crazy to listen to a podcast from, from five years ago. <laughs> well, that, hear us be up. no, that is pretty cool. Uh, I'm, it's very cool. I'm glad you said that. It has significant meaning to me, and I just don't turn into James Harden and demand a trade in a year. Uh, how about that? No, nah, homie. No, nah, homie. We stuck. <laughs> I, and I, like, and I, it's funny you bring that up. Um, there are other podcasts. There's other things I'm working on. There's some other type of podcast, the type of work I want to do, um, and, we, and I will do. Um, but the A to Z podcast is the original that, that will ever, forever stand. Uh, we're a group, man. You know that. There have been times where I've could have broke away and done a, I'm not leaving A to Z, and I know you're not leaving A to Z. No matter what Fox Sports says, no matter what STO says, no matter what the athletic says, we a package. We come together. <laughs> <laughs> when I started thinking about the about leading that one with the Adele song, I was driving down the road. I was crying. I, I was crying. I, I really was. 
<laughs> so I was I in mean, I was in the right lane. I can picture exactly where I was. And if somebody pulled up next to me in the left lane and saw me crying, they probably thought, "Oh, gee, oh, that guy's having a bad day." I was having a wonderful well, like day. A, <laughs> yeah. Well, like a dummy, like a dummy. I start. I was so excited. I start playing. I was in the kitchen, and I start playing it. The kids run out. They hear Adele, and my daughter's like. She goes, oh, I love that song. And Jen's like, what are you playing? And I'm like, oh, nothing. It's just me. And then I'm like, we won't cuss early on. <laughs> and lo and behold, uh, well, that was before the disclaimer, I guess. <laughs> I love us. Thank you guys for being a part of us. We appreciate y'all. You guys are Yes, the best. thank you guys for listening from the bottom of our cold, clogged hearts. We mean it. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Can you see cold-ass weather and James Harden's belly? <laughs>